Remember, Don, when God closes a door, he opens a dress. The costumes in Matthew Weiner's Mad Men hold more than meets the eye. In this series, every outfit tells a story and style is a language of its own. The garments represent characters' transformative journeys or offer them an alternative way of expression in times when social and cultural norms limited their ability to speak openly. In this video, I am continuing to explore the meaning behind the iconic outfits in Mad Men and illustrate the power of fashion as a silent storyteller. In the episode entitled Souvenir, Betty joins Dawn on his business trip to Rome. Why Rome? Probably because the show constantly draws analogies between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Draper's marriage. The warmth of the climate disposed the natives the most intemperate enjoyment of tranquility and opulence. In my previous video, I explored Betty's personality and her crumbling marriage quite extensively, so if you haven't seen part 1, I highly recommend doing so. Upon arrival in Rome, Betty decides to get a whole Italian makeover. After all, she and Don stay in a luxurious Hilton hotel, all expenses paid. This is their first trip alone without the kids, so why not spice things up a little? Later in the evening, she appears wearing this stunning black empire waist cocktail dress embellished with fringes designed by Cuban-born American fashion designer Luis Estevez. Estevez was known for creating seductive, often form-hugging dresses with with interesting necklines and high slits. He was famously quoted saying, every lady wants to look racy once in a while and boy oh boy doesn't Betty look exactly so in this outfit. It's a stark departure from her usual demure looks and it reflects her unexplored desires. Typically we see Betty dressed in modest and for that time pretty outdated pastel colored shirt dresses, but here she couldn't be more on top of trends. She wears bubble ears earrings years before Twiggy did and she is here to be admired by everyone around her. From her updo to makeup and jewelry, everything on her screams poise and glamour. If you couldn't tell, this is my all-time favorite look from Mad Men and yes, I would call it my Roman Empire. Pun intended. I'm only in Rome for one night. I won't have my heart broken. Aside from Betty's stunning outfit and the steamy energy between her and Dawn, this scene is actually pretty bittersweet. For one, we know that Betty could never dress like this at home, Dawn would never approve of it. Where are you going to that? <laughs> Swimming. It's desperate. He allows it here because they're abroad and nobody knows them. Secondly, because of the way the scene was written and shot, we pretty much see Betty and Dawn through the eyes of those two Italian men. They're not married, and their marriage isn't crumbling at all. They're just two glamorous strangers. He exudes an enormous amount of confidence and single-handedly wins the most fabulous woman in the restaurant, and she is a modern and liberated woman totally in control of the situation. Right? We've spent three seasons witnessing how Betty and Don's marriage make them miserable, yet in this particular scene we can't help but root for them. We can't help ourselves but to go into what-if scenarios. What if these two lived in a big city instead of the suburbs? What if Betty never quit her modeling career and Don wasn't so controlling and dominating? Would that save their relationship? Would that make them happier? Even though we should have been asking ourselves, what if Betty accepted a drink from one of those two Italians? What if the hem of her dress was a little bit shorter? Don't we have enough information about Don already to predict his reaction? You let a stranger in my house? You made a fool of yourself. Why would she say that? You were throwing yourself at him, giggling at his stories. I was being friendly. Who the hell is Henry Francis? At this point in the show, not only do we know that this marriage is really over, but so do the characters. So this scene is a bittersweet reminder that Sometimes the most powerful moments are the ones that remain confined to our dreams, tucked away in the ruins of the Roman Empire, just like Betty's captivating Roman holiday look. That's real politics. Well, you know, when you don't have any power, you have to delay things. 
Shirley Campbell is one of my favorite characters on Mad Men. Apart from her fabulous hats, I admire her wit and how she always expects to be taken seriously. We meet her in season 1 as an affluent and fashionable housewife who leads a glamorous urban life. Unlike Betty, who struggles in her role as a homemaker, Trudy thrives in it. She genuinely wants Pete to succeed in his job, she can't wait to become a mother, but most importantly, she wishes to form a true partner with her husband. Unfortunately, Trudy doesn't really get an arc for the first two seasons. Her daily activities, her circle of friends, and her individuality remain largely unexplored. Instead, she's portrayed as a mere extension of her husband, and this lack of personal identity is cleverly represented in Trudy's fashion style. In the early seasons of Mad Men, whenever Trudy is at home, her clothing blends seamlessly with the surroundings, making her look like a chameleon in its habitat. In the episode where the Campbells look at their future apartment, her coat blends with the walls. In this scene, the color of her dress and the tablecloth match perfectly. Even here, the print on her dress harmonizes with the city lights, further emphasizing her role as a background figure. Interestingly enough, this costuming technique wasn't limited to Trudy, it was also applied to Betty's character and it was meant to reflect the societal expectations for housewives at that time. Furthermore, whenever Trudy goes out with Pete, their color palette is either in complete synergy or they're dressed in Pete's color, which is blue. Gray suits dominate within the wardrobes of the associates of Sterling Cooper, but notably Pete wears a blue one. He wears it so often that it becomes his signature look, making him easily identifiable in the crowd of other employees. Thing like that. Despite being newly wedded, Trudy and Pete's marriage isn't particularly strong at the beginning as they struggle with fertility issues, so having them appear in social situations in matching outfits serves as a mask for their domestic problems. From the outside they look like one big happy couple, but from the inside their marriage is in turmoil by the end of second season. And yes, I love my parents and they love me. Do you? If you did, you'd want to be with me. I'm unsure what happens in their relationship between seasons 2 and 3, but they seem to have worked through their problems. For the first time, we start to see glimpses of Trudy's everyday life, she becomes more confident and starts to voice her opinions more openly, which is reflected in her wardrobe. Her outfits and color palette gradually make her stand out in crowds until this moment when she actively refuses to blend with the background. Previously, we have seen Trudy Trudy dressed in vibrant royal blues, but only when the company of her wealthy, upper-class parents couldn't make Pete undermine her opinions and wishes. Here, the Campbells are expected to attend Margaret Sterling's wedding, but Pete doesn't feel like going. He anticipated a big job promotion, but got passed over for someone else. I'm a count something. I couldn't even hear him. All I saw was his frog-like mouth flapping. On top of that, they're watching the news about Kennedy's assassination and are upset that Margaret's wedding is still happening. At first, Trudy doesn't want to skip the wedding. She made an effort to dress up in this gorgeous silk royal blue gown that makes her literally define glamour, not to mention her adorable matching silk heels. However, she changes her mind as Pete tells her about his colleagues who were calculating lost ad revenue instead of mourning. This is a pivotal moment for Trudy, who previously cared about money and status a little too much. Up to this point, an event like the wedding of her husband's boss's daughter would be the highlight of her social season, but now she realizes that there are more important things in life. This is also a pivotal moment for Pete and Trudy's marriage, as for the first time they are on the same page. Previously, we've seen them constantly fight over an apartment or a possible adoption, but now they're as strong as ever. From this scene onward, whenever Trudy wears blue, she no longer matches Pete, signifying both a newfound sense of independence, but also unity within their relationship. I'll lose my partnership. You'll lose your stateroom on the Titanic? 
In contrast to Trudy, Joan is a character in Mad Men who never struggles to stand out. Actually, you would never mistake her for just another secretary. Joan exudes confidence. She's desirable, cynical, self-assured and terribly good at her job. Plus, she's the type of a girl who perfectly understands her assets and never misses on an opportunity to accentuate them. So her wardrobe consists of tight sweaters, pencil skirts, form-fitting dresses in jewel tone colors, with red being her signature color. Red and green are my colors, so we're gonna do Christmas. He doesn't know that yet. But what sets her apart from the rest of the female co-workers at Sterling Cooper isn't just her bold personality and color palette, but her iconic pen necklace. In season 4, Joey tells Peggy, There's a Joan in every company. My mother was a Joan. She even wore a pen around her neck so people would stare at her tits. Here's what Jenny Bryant, Mad Men costume designer, had to say about Joan's necklace. Joan in early seasons was never seen at work without her pen necklace. I found this in a vintage shop and it screamed Joan as soon as I found it. It's a part of status symbol for her. She commands the girls in the office and everybody knows it. Throughout the years, there's been many fan theories regarding the meaning of this jewelry piece. Some fans view it as a symbol of Joan's ambition to be independent and in control of her life, while others believe it represents her humble beginnings as a secretary. What do you think? He may act like he wants a secretary, but most of the time they're looking for something between a mother and a waitress. As you see, the amount of research and detail that went into designing costumes on Mad Men is astonishing. Each sartorial choice, whether Don Draper's impeccably tailored suit or John Holloway's form-fitting dress, is a window into the characters in their world and the societal norms that shape their lives. Please let me know if you'll be interested in style analyses of side characters such as Francine, Anna Draper or Mona. I've been also looking at the fashion choices of Dawn's mistresses and there are some interesting similarities between them so this could be another video idea. Thank you so much for watching and for the positive feedback I got on my first Mad Men video. I am so grateful and slightly overwhelmed by it. Please don't forget to like this video, maybe follow me on Instagram if you're into more recent fashion and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye! You have your fingers in your ears? It's a chip and dip. You have your friends over, you put chips on the sides and dip in the middle.